Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's Thanksgiving, and once again, I'm Dan alongside Matt, giving thanks for the start of another NHL season. Matt, without talking too much about the games, in one sentence, how would you rate opening week for the Flames? Worrying, then encouraging. It's a good way to put it. Well, we'll get to those two games that we're worried and encouraged by, but first let's work our way backwards from Wednesday when the season opened. The first thing the Flames had to do before they could open the season was name their official leadership team. And this year, uh, Matthew Kachuk and Michael Backlund have been named the two alternates alongside Sean Monaghan, who is already an alternate. Kachuk will be the alternate at when the team is not at the Dome, and Backlund will be the alternate when the team is at the Dome. And as far as Matt and I understand it, they will alternate mid-season, where Kachuk will then be the alternate at the Dome, Backlund when they're not at the Dome. So that gives Backlund, Kachuk, and Monaghan A's, and of course Giordano still the captain. Uh, Matt, I think we all saw this coming for Kachuk sooner rather than later. What are your thoughts on these three guys wearing the A? Ever since the Flames drafted Kachuk, I've had a sneaking suspicion that he'd actually be the next captain of the team, so uh, even ahead of Sean Monaghan. And I could see that still happening, and it, him getting an A is exemplified in that because of the fact that he's more willing to speak up and speak his mind instead of being the quiet guy that's just you know, comfortably in the background at times. And what about Backlund? A long time coming. He, I think he's a, been a leader of this team for a number of seasons now. He just never got the A put on his jersey. Yeah, I think it's. I think it also shows that Backlund's becoming one of the, and it's weird to think of, but one of the veteran guys in this team. I know. Just yesterday, he was drafted by the Flames, like 24th overall in 2007. Time flies, though, unfortunately. Yeah, and then outside of those guys, the Flames made two roster moves that I think we're both expecting and thinking might happen. Dylan Dubé and Yuso Valamaki both made the team out of camp. Uh, Dubé will be wearing jersey number 29 this season while he's in Calgary, and Yuso Valamaki number 8. Matt... I guess we can talk about their opening week performance as well, but you thought probably both these guys would make the lineup. I'll let you give your thoughts first. What do you think on Dubé and Valimaki being here to start? Well, I think it was the right call. Uh, You look at Brett Kulak and the other guys like Prout and all of the other competition, and yes, Valimaki just turned 20 this week, but he, talent-wise, is clearly better than the other options. So... It made sense, like even though he could have probably used some time in Stockton, just like when with Monahan and Gaudreau, sometimes talent overrides that necessity. And I think with Valimaki, especially in the first couple of games, he has not looked out of place at all, and frankly has been the best player on his pairing in each of the games. And uh, Dylan Dubé. Similarly, I think he outplayed all of the competition that he had for the 12th roster spot and has played fairly well. I wouldn't say that he's been great in the couple of games, but he needs... like it. it you can see flashes with him that there's more there there. And he will be good down the road, but there's also some issues in his game. But that's to be expected. What are you identifying as Dubé's issue so far? Uh, just not uh, quite quick enough sometimes with his decision making. But that makes sense because of the fact that he's going from basically juniors to the NHL. He only played a couple of games in Stockton last season. So, and like the hit uh, by... Uh, Was that the good Branson hit? Yeah, like he wasn't prepared for, you know, like the necessity to keep your head up at all times and pay attention at all times. Just minor things like that, where you know, it minor issues that most young players go through, but you know, still stuff that he has to work on. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily a Dubé issue or if it's just a young NHLer issue that we're seeing there. Mm-hmm. I think that down the um, road, uh, he might not be a bad option on either the first or second line right wing spot, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah, I don't think we'll see much of that this season. I think even just no. salary-wise, if you're putting him there, you uh, it, it makes you wonder why these other guys aren't performing to that level and we'd have some issues. But I could definitely see that down the road, two, three years, him being the number one right winger. His speed would complement either of those lines. Because we've seen with Zarnik in the second game, his speed worked well with Backlund and Kachuk. So it's possible that something along those lines could work the same for Dubé, who's similarly fast. Yeah, I like the fact that Dubé's here to start. I know I wasn't a fan of him starting here, but I like that they've been giving him minutes. And if you remember last year, or last week, sorry, my um, argument was he's got to get play time. So in the uh, Vancouver, the game in Vancouver, he played nine minutes total. And uh, nine minutes, seven seconds, sorry, 52 of those were shorthanded. And in the home opener, he played 12 minutes, 51 seconds, 41 of those shorthanded. So I like that he's getting the play time. And I think if his play time goes any lower, we really have to wonder if he's, I think if he's playing less than nine minutes a night, we really have to wonder if this is the best environment for him. Similar with Valimaki in the first game, Valimaki played 10 minutes, 19 seconds. And in the home opener, he played 13 minutes, six seconds, which is a good number for a defenseman. That's uh, quite high if you look at the stats. So Yeah, it, it's one of those things with Valimaki that in the first game, you know, you don't want to throw him to the wolves too quickly either because, you know, it, it is a big change in what he's facing. So, But he played so well in that first game that he got rewarded with more responsibility in the second one. Yeah. I still think that the Flames were going to bring up a young defenseman. It should have been Anderson. I mean, he's here now, and we'll talk about how that happened later in the show. But I just think that bringing Valimaki up to start the season here maybe wasn't the most, um, I don't want to say responsible, maybe optically responsible thing to do to say, hey, Raz, you've been working hard on this. You're probably the most ready, but we're going to start you in the A. I just thought maybe that sends the wrong message from management and coaching. Well, after one game, that got sorted out rather quite quickly, so unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's we, we've seen hot players then who fizzled. David Moss is a great example. So just because, you know, Valimaki started hot doesn't mean he'll stay hot. But hopefully the Flames can ride this while he's, while he's there. And I think the fact that Hamnick's out, which we can talk about next, um, I think that's going to help Valimaki stay here for a little bit longer. So let's talk about that. So the Flames opened the season against Vancouver, and Matt mentioned it earlier, Good Branson tried to take some liberties with Dubé early on, and good for Hamannick, being the veteran defenseman, stepped in to avenge his teammate. But uh, when you're Hamannick's size, you probably don't want to take on Eric Good Branson, and that's exactly what he did, broke his jaw, and he's now week to week in the uh, injury report. So the Calgary Flames called up Rasmus Anderson to fill his spot, but instead of playing Anderson, played Dalton Prout in the home opener. Uh, Matt, let's go through this kind of piece by piece. So what do you think of the Flames' choice to play Prout over Anderson? Do you think it was just to get some toughness in the lineup? Well, that's the only reason why I thought the Flames should have had Anthony Peluso as the extra forward at the start of the season. Because sometimes you run into teams that have nothing better going for them than having a bunch of losers that are trying to hurt the opposition because, hey, I'm awesome. And that's basically what happened with Good Branson. He's trying to make an impression on his team that, oh, hey, I can go hurt this defensive, defenseless player and takes a dumb penalty and then goes and gets into a fight. And, you know, good for Vancouver. You know, they're going to lose a lot of games, and th that's why they have players like Good Branson. But the Flames need to have deterrence to prevent stuff like that from happening. And guys like Peluso, guys like Prout, are necessary when they're playing teams like Vancouver, who have nothing better to do than to be like that. Do you think that Hamannick was wrong to have gone toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with Good Branson trying to avenge his rookie teammate? 
he was literally the only guy that could have. So he did. And, you know, full marks to him. It's unfortunate that he got hurt. Usually that doesn't happen, but un- it, he got caught the right way, and it was just an unfortunate thing. But the Flames shouldn't have put Hamannick or Dubé in that position, especially with having two young players making their NHL debut. It was bad form, I think, to especially with their opponent being Vancouver. Like, if they were playing Nashville or something like that, then there wouldn't have been any need for that kind of a player. But with Vancouver, they're more likely to do dirty things just because of the fact that they're going to be one of the worst teams in the league. And the Flames put their players in a bad spot because of it. And now they got to be without Hamnick for a few weeks and then another couple weeks for him to get back into proper swing of with things. So just an unfortunate situation all the way around. Yeah, I, I don't cre- I don't discredit or think Hamannick shouldn't have fought. I think, like you said, he's probably one of the few guys that could. I don't want him to get into the habit of being that tough guy. I think that's other guys' roles. But good for him for stepping up and you know trying to protect his rookie teammate. It's unfortunate, but I think... I'd rather get some of these injuries out of the way early if we're going to have them. And we'll see how the Flames can do it. And maybe this is where, as you and I talked about last week, someone can force their way into lineup. We saw that with Janko last year with some injuries. Maybe this is where, whether it's Prout or Anderson, I think probably more Anderson than Prout, is going to you know potentially force the Flames' hands to move uh, an existing defenseman. And that's where opportunities come in. If Anderson plays well, he'll earn himself a spot full-time in the NHL. If he doesn't, or if he's just okay, then he'll probably return back to Stockton and get recalled the next time somebody's out. Yeah, and and I think at some point, I mean, there may be that, okay, let's uh, you know try him out for a little bit, see if he can do better than Valimaki and make them fight it out as well. You never know what we'll see there, but I, can, I think both those guys will be trading some NHL games this season. Very well could be. I think that if you look at the week coming up with Nashville, with St. Louis, with Colorado as the games, I would rather see Anderson against those teams than I would Prout. Um, I'm thinking that Anderson probably plays in all three. What do you think? I agree fully. Prout was necessary for the second Vancouver game just so, hey, don't do any crap anymore. And now that they're playing teams with actual talent on them, they don't need to worry quite so much about any antics. And on that, I guess, sort of note, the pro was there to keep everyone in line. The Flames did call Anthony Peluso up from the AHL. Um, do you think that we see him play here? Do you think he's going to be sent back to Stockton in short order? I think he'll stick for a while just to... With Lazar being back in the AHL, I think that Peluso will just stay as the 14th forward for a while. And any time that the uh, date on the calendar shows one of those type of teams that have the same thing with Vancouver, then I think that's when you'll see Peluso draw into the lineup. Otherwise, it'll just be all things as normal. You're probably right. Yeah, I I forgot about that for a second. Yeah, Lazar got sent to the HL, so it does open up a forward spot, and they could definitely carry Peluso there. Well, let's let's talk about that quickly. So Curtis Lazar, as we know, cleared waivers. We talked about him being on waivers last week. No one took him, and the question is, what do the Flames do with him? And I was kind of surprised when he cleared waivers and stayed here, especially because Lazar himself said he thought maybe going to the AHL would be a good idea. And I'll quote him here. He said, quote, for me, I'm kind of fed up being that so-so guy that's just plugged in here and there. I want to rebuild my game and reestablish myself. And I think the organization is on the same page with that, end quote. He really, he said in another uh, quote, quote, I just want to play. If it's here, if it's down in the minors, anything, I just need to play, end quote. So, you know, you and I talked about this. Not a lot of guys really asked to be sent to the minors, but good for Curtis Lazar for saying, hey, I need a play, and I'm okay to do that in the AHL if that's what's going to get me the play time. Um, I think it's a good place for him to be right now. I think he can 
potentially put up a lot of points, be a good mentor for some of the young kids there. And hopefully he will be back sooner rather than later because he's found that spark he was missing. And that's necessary for him. Uh, You could see when he's been playing over the last year and a half since we acquired him that his timing just seemed off with pretty much all of his plays. Like his shots would just miss or his passes would be just a little off or like everything just seemed a little out of sorts and like he was very rusty more than anything so him getting say like 15 18 minutes in stockton every night that would go a long way for him to just regain confidence in his own abilities and hopefully he starts putting up some points and then can earn his way back into the nhl Frankly, I don't think this is the last we've seen of Lazar in a Flames jersey, but he has a lot of work to do to rebuild everything in his game to push back into the NHL. I think not only getting more minutes in the AHL is going to be important for him, but giving him a place where he can safely test, maybe tweaking his game a bit. I mean, I don't think Lazar on this team is going to be or needs to be a guy who's looked out of putting the puck in the net more often than not, I think Lazar, when he comes to get back to Calgary, can be, I think, more of a two-way center, more of a setup guy. I think that's going to get him in this lineup more often. And so I think maybe going to the AHL, playing with a couple different guys, they can see what role works best for Curtis and work to accentuate those strengths. And that's not something you can really do during the NHL season. So I'm hoping that when we see Lazar, I agree, it's probably not the last we've seen of him. Um, I think he'll definitely be back at some point. But I think the question becomes, what will his role be when he comes back? And that's what I'll be curious to see is there, is can they tweak him? Can they move him in a different direction? Sort of like we've seen with Backlund, where he really became more of a, a two-way center and has become more valuable with the team since. I guess Lazar becomes the first call-up, or do you think he'll stay down there until they're good and ready to give him a, a full-time spot in the top 12? If he shows well, like say he's putting up like a 40-point pace, in Stockton, or something, like where he's one of the leading scorers of the team, then I think he'll earn his way back. If not, I think that you're probably looking at Manjapane instead, but we'll see. It depends basically on Curtis at this point. If he goes and tears it up, he'll be back sooner than later, and if not, then... They'll probably go with a guy who has more longer-term upside if it's not working right. Yeah, I I think you're right. It's really up to Curtis Lazar. I mean, I give the kid a lot of credit for wanting to go to the HL, wanting to play, understanding that's what he needs. And unfortunately, there's some guys in the career, really just those tweener guys. And I think it's very possible... Lazar becomes that next tweener guy for the Flames who goes up and down. I don't think he's ever going to be a really attractive waiver pickup. Um, I don't know if he would ever get to the waiver mark again this year, but I can see, especially for this year, he becomes that tweener guy. Maybe it's better to leave Mangiapane in the AHL, let Mangiapane, you know, get comfortable down there. I think a lot of those guys that we moved around last year weren't comfortable and we broke their rhythm. And maybe it's okay, Mangiapane, you stay in the AHL. You do your thing, and Curtis will be that tweener who comes up and down because he knows how to fill in once in a while. I'm not sure, but it'll be interesting to see. Well, Matt, with that, uh, shall we talk about the first two Calgary Flames games for the season? Sure. That looks. It the, was a weird pair of games, that's for sure. It was. So the Calgary Flames started their season uh the 2018-2019 season on the road in vancouver a game that we're all looking forward to and i think we can probably say that one man won this game for vancouver the canucks took a 5-2 win and i think elias Pettersson is really the only reason that the the vancouver canucks won this game the flames didn't look their best they still looked like they were trying to sort a lot of stuff out trying to figure things out here but the biggest thing i can say in this one is how do you go with seven power plays not score on one of them. I mean, we've said for years the biggest problem with this team was special teams, and you you can't be getting seven man advantages not scoring any one of them. To me, that's really what tanked the Flames. 
Well, it was one of those weird games where Calgary pretty much dominated in every single aspect and still lost significantly. Like, if you look at the goals that Vancouver scored, they were mostly off of defensive lapses that gave, like, brilliant chances to their team, and they capitalized on them. And I think Calgary outshot them significantly in that game. And it just frustrating to see the flames top end forwards kind of mail it in for the first two periods like i didn't think that anybody frankly on the flames had anything going in a positive direction for the first uh couple periods it wasn't until the canucks went up three nothing that the give a it, you know give an effort meter uh actually turned on and you know the they did mount a comeback but it was far too late at that point and i think a lot of times last season that was the story of the game is too little too late the team would try to come back and they'd run out of time to do so and when i watched this game i i had to check my watch a few times i'm like are we still in last season or is the new season started because it just it looked eerily similar to a game from last year. Yeah. The encouraging thing was that they drew seven penalties. And I all of all seven of them, frankly, were warranted. And they were skating a lot more. And that was one of the things that last year they didn't draw too many penalties because they were less likely to be skating hard with the puck and more standing still at times. And it... You can usually tell on the power play sheet whether a team is giving a good effort in terms of their having their motor going. They weren't clicking, mind you, at all, either when they were 5-on-5 five five or on the power play, but they were skating hard, at least. And that was an encouraging sign, but you know, it didn't result in any points. Looking at the last couple games of the preseason and then that game and the home game, I'd say, you know, if you look, the Flames are really playing a high-speed, aggressive game, and it's going to, as you mentioned, generate penalties. That's, I think, part of their game this season. But if you're going to generate penalties, you have to be able to capitalize them, capitalize on them. And while I think Markstrom was hot here, you can't go seven power plays in one game and not score on one. That looks terrible on you. So I think the real big thing this team has to make sure of is Whatever it takes, you've got to score on those man advantages. Yeah, and frankly, if Markstrom wasn't on the top of his game, the Flames probably win that game, like 6-4 or something like that. What did you think of Dubé and Valimaki in that game? They were okay. I thought Valimaki was a little quiet, but he'd jump in at the right times, which his offensive instincts are very good. So that's encouraging to see. Dubé, that whole line with um, him and Ryan, it it just looked kind of off. And, like, there wasn't a lot of chemistry with James Neal. And I think that that needs to change because I don't think that Neal is a good fit with those guys. I Frankly, I'd rather see Froelich with those two. But we'll see. Yeah, I thought Dubé looked good. He, I mean, for a bottom six guy, you don't see him a lot. He didn't play a lot of hockey, as we talked about earlier. But I thought when he was in the ice, you saw him jumping in when he had to. He's He played okay off the puck, but I think that's one of the areas he needs to work on is you know being in the right position when he's off the puck. Too many times I saw him kind of closing in on the, on the guys who had the puck and then being out of position when his team got it back. So that was one thing I think he's going to have to work on. For Valimaki, I wasn't all that happy that game. I think one Vancouver goal was directly contributed to Valimaki being in the wrong spot. Um, he, he made some mistakes. I mean, the whole team did, but I thought it wasn't a great showing for him in his first NHL game. Yeah, I can see that. He was okay. He was okay, but I thought that, you know, again, rookie mistakes like we talked about earlier, I think that at least one goal came directly because of his rookie mistake 
And I just thought that, you know, for a guy who's trying to stay here, it maybe wasn't the best game. But I'm glad that he got another game, um, you know, in, in the home opener. Well, let's talk about that home opener. The Calgary Flames uh, took Thanksgiving weekend, and on Saturday night, they took to the ice for the home opener. Um, The Calgary Flames, as we know, sorry, before we get to the home opener, the Calgary Flames lost their ninth consecutive season opener, which is now an NHL record. So not doing too... No, it's not. Are you sure? Uh, the record's 12, second is 11, and then we're third Okay, I think it's nine. an active NHL record then. I was looking it up. Yeah. Yeah, it's an active NHL record. Yeah, it was the, Yeah, it was Detroit and Pittsburgh with the first and second. They were kind of terrible in the 80s. Yeah, I, I, I was trying so. to go back, and there's some fuzzy record keeping, and it's hard to find individual game records sometimes. But as far as I could see, just looking at active records, uh, that's the longest. Yeah. So with that, on Saturday, the Calgary Flames took Thanksgiving Saturday and had their home opener. They wore their retro jerseys as they opened at home and again took on Vancouver in the second half of the of the home-and-home home series. And this time, Calgary came out triumphant with a 7-4 victory over Vancouver. And, you know, as much as I've heard everyone looking at this game saying, well, we won, at the same time, I'm going, if you get four goals scored on you in any night it generally means you're not having a good night. I mean, we should not have had four goals scored against Smitty that night. When I look at this game, I think the best way I sum it up again is the Flames need to capitalize on those chances. They did a better job this game, but not as good as they could have. And I think that they looked good most of the night in Vancouver's end, but I thought that they gave up too many opportunities in their own end. There's too many times I saw Vancouver guys right in front of the net and right in front of the crease when they shouldn't have been there and they should have been cleared out earlier. So... Maybe some defensive lapses there to get those four goals in. Yeah, like, if you look at each of the four goals that Smith allowed, I can't really blame him directly on any of them. And, you know, it it wasn't, uh, you know, anytime a goalie gives up four goals, that's obviously not ideal, but I can't really blame him for him having a bad game where I thought he did kind of have a little bit of a bad one in the first game. And he did turn the game when uh, in the third period with that big glove save on Goldobin. So, you know, it's one of those situations where the Flames need to tighten up defensively and not allow as many odd man rushes. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't think Smitty was at fault, really, for any of those. I thought he looked like his usual self. It was mostly, I don't want to say the defenseman, but defensive lapses, both the forwards and the defensemen in their own zone, who were lapsing and letting the Canucks get better chances than they should have. And that needs to be tightened up. I thought there was great pressure on Markstrom all night. The Flames were generally in position. I didn't see what you and I have talked about in the past so often is the puck is in the offensive net and nobody, or in the offensive zone, and nobody's near the net. Like, how many times have we seen that? You and I have talked about it. It's like, we're ready to shoot, and there's nobody in position for the rebound. I agree. It was interesting that uh, that whole play that led to Vancouver's fourth goal, or first goal, like the whole stick changing situation there, like, that was a bit of a tire fire of a situation yeah, and then i thought it was awesome in this game too when the flames got one called back and went out and got it right back right after that it's like okay i uh, yeah it's like okay yeah who cares you we'll called the goal do it off. again yeah and frankly that that's a big difference from last year because if that had happened last year Honestly, Vancouver probably wins that game 6-2. to two. Yeah, I think the fact it's early in the season helps too. I mean, it was the home opener, and I think everybody was probably more jazzed up than they would be in December or January at that point. And I think more than even, you know, like you were saying last year and this year, I think it's just the home opener effect. The team got one call back and wanted to go do it for the Sea of Red. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't. I did not really agree with the call on that one. No, but it is but, what it is, and you know you gotta you gotta go out and play the game that you're given. True enough. So this game, uh, the first goal of the year this year in Vancouver came from Chucky, who got the first goal. And the goals at home, uh, we saw Lindholm get his first, 
Gio get his first of the year. Goudreau get his first of the year. Monaghan get his second. Lindholm got his second. Zarnik got his first. And Froelich got his first. So I guess all the suspects we were kind of looking at to get goals are there, except maybe Neil. Um, and But, you know, good to see Zarnik. I thought Zarnik played really hard. When I look at that home game, I think Zarnik and Lindholm, to me, were the two best flames of that game, besides Smitty. I have to, yeah, I have to agree. And I, and for Zarnik, I mean, you talked about potentially putting him on the second line last last week. I think that this is the kind of game that could move him up the lineup and make him a more valuable piece here. I agree. And what a nice uh, addition Elias Lindholm has been to the first line. He's fit in like a glove with the Monahan and Gaudreau. Yeah, and I mean, in the summer, if you look back when we acquired those two, Lindholm and Hannafin. People were just talking about Hannafin, and a few times Tree said, remember Lindholm came as well, and I think people were writing Lindholm off. And yeah, it's still early in the season, but I'm really liking what we see from Lindholm so far. I don't know if he'll stay on that first line, but it's nice to know that we have options there. And I really feel like no matter where Lindholm plays, it really gives us that extra scoring piece that I think we've been needing. Mm-hmm. And you have to realize that Carolina didn't really have any offensive talent around Lindholm. So going from a situation like that where you're basically having to be the guy or one of the guys to create all the offense to coming to Calgary where you're playing with two of the premier scorers in the league, that definitely makes your day a little bit easier. Yeah, I mean, even last year, Lindholm got 44 points in 81 games. The year before, 45 points in 72 games. I think Lindholm might be the guy who I think Yari Hoodler could have been, where Hoodler came here not being the man in Detroit and was put into a top-line role and I think really allowed to spread his wings. And I think we might see that with Lindholm. He came from a team where he couldn't spread his wings. He wasn't able to be the offensive guy he should have. And he comes here, gets put in a different scenario where he can be more offensive and have good offensive partners around him. And I think we're going to see him blossom here. Which that would be just awesome if that worked out. So we were talking a little bit last week about the lines and where we thought the lines would be. And Matt, if we take a look at the practice lines from today, they've really uh, ended up being a little bit more like what you were talking about last week. If we look at where the practice lines have been, it's been Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm on line one. I think we, we were both kind of expecting that's where things would start. Kachuk, Backlund, Zarnik on line two. I think that's exactly what you predicted. Yep. Uh, third line has been Bennett on the left, Dubé at center, and James Neal. I like that line, but at the same time, I look at it and go, ah, do I really want a guy like Neal who's making so much being on the third line? And it says a lot for Zarnik for forcing his way up, but it just seems like on paper, Neal should be higher in the lineup. I'm actually a little confused why Dubé's in that line, frankly. I think... Having Bennett with Jankowski and Neil would make a lot more sense, but it might just have been an off day for Jankowski. Yeah, Jankowski is one of the extra floating forwards with Peluso today, so maybe he's a bit banged up. Yeah, that's the only thing that would make a lot of sense to me, but because it does, it, you know, if you put Janko in that spot, like that, I think would be a pretty good line, sort of like the Auger. It being with those two guys yeah, last year. Yeah, I was just about year. to say that. That gives them the veteran, you know, adult supervision, if you will. Yeah. Um, okay, kids, this is how we put the puck in the net. <laughs> that's right. All right, here's the puck. Do something with it. Yeah, no, I think they need that. I think, you know, Bennett and I think Bennett and Jankowski have got some good chemistry going there. I don't want to break them up yet. I don't think Dubé will be there in the next game, but it's an intriguing trio to look at and say, yeah, maybe there's something to try there. Yep. And then the last line is Froelich, Ryan, and Hathaway. And again, when I look at it and I go, wow, Froelich on the fourth line? That seems kind of crazy based on who he is in his game. But it really shows you how guys are forcing their way up this this lineup. Yeah, well, it creates a balanced attack. And it, like it, if you put Dubé with the Froelich line as the fourth line, I think that would be uh, top-notch third line on most teams, let alone being the fourth line. So I think that like this year's edition of the Flames, I think you're going to have to drop the whole notion of 
the first line, the second line, the third line, and the fourth line because it they're for like the first time since 1990, the Flames have depth throughout the lineup. Yeah, I think if the Flames can get up by a couple in a game, we might even see them just roll these lines. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked like if the game's out of reach, just you know everybody you know. Next, next, next. Exactly. You don't do it to start with because you got to get your powerhouses on the ice to get you points on the board. But I can definitely see it. Even if they're up by two or three, you know, just start rolling the lines until it starts to slip away. Yeah. And then. And the fresh legs would help to keep the ball rolling as well because the other teams are going to be burning their top guys trying to get back into the game. Exactly. And I think the other nice thing about it when you think about it is injuries are going to happen. I mean, this team generally gets plagued by injuries at some point. And when you look at all this depth, especially at the forward ranks, if one guy's out, it's easy to reshuffle. You don't look at the lineup and go, oh, that guy's on the second line? You know, there's nobody here besides maybe Hathaway that I go, this guy couldn't play in the top nine. So I think it gives you a lot of options when we start getting those injuries. Yep. Um, and then on the defensive side, just to point out some changes there, Hannafin and Stone, as we saw last game, played together, and Valimaki Anderson were the third pairing. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Valimaki Anderson's the pair we see going into Nashville. I'm actually quite excited to see those two guys if they play together. Now, would you have ever thought, like af- at this point in the Flames' r- building process, that half of their defensemen would be like under the age of 21? Nope. I would say I drink to that, but that's not fair to those guys. <laughs> um, it's you know it's good to see though, right? And I mean, even bringing in a guy like Hannafin, who is already a very established twenty-one year old, you need those young guys in the lineup, and it's nice to see that for every every team that gets a Mark Giordano. You know, we've seen the guys like the Seabrooks and that who they get an aging defenseman, and there's no heir apparent. And I think the Flames are doing a good job realizing Gio's getting older, and you know, let's bring some young guys in to you know to be the younger back end of that lineup but no you're right i never would have anticipated that valimaki anderson hannafin all 21 or younger on this lineup is half the lineup that's what you expect from a team who's you know fully in rebuild mode not a team that's looking for a playoff spot yeah like if you're looking at say edmonton or vancouver or something like that 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 would make a lot more sense but you know, and it's a credit to the, all three of those guys. All, they're all deserving of being in the NHL, so it's not like they're just being thrown in there because, hey, you're a guy that can play. For sure, and I think in some ways, and I know this is going to sound weird, but in some ways the Flames' lack of draft picks has helped them because they haven't been flooding the system with new guys. There's been guys like Anderson and Shillington who have been able to kind of maintain their role as the top HL guys because there hasn't been a lot of new guys coming in there. The Flames haven't had a lot of picks, so they've had a few years to develop there before it's like, okay, we're bringing new guys in. Someone's got to either move up or move out because we're running out of roster spots. Yeah, and I think that with this upcoming draft, you'll probably see the Flames throw some picks towards the blue line just because of the fact that we're pretty much stocked up front. And, like, our prospect pool for defensemen now consists of all over Shillington and crickets, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, even Shillington is in the AHL. We really don't have any defensemen now who aren't playing in the AHL, who are still playing junior. And we got no goalies that way either, really. So I think the Flames need to throw a pick at a goaltender as well. I mean, we've got tons of pro goalies, but by the time we figure out what we want to do with them, the next guy will be ready. Um, going back to the home opener, Matt, we saw the red, I guess, retro jerseys, as we call them. Any thoughts on seeing the retros again as the thirds? They're okay. The, I, I, to me, like they look nice on the ice, and they're fine. It's just, they're kind of bland. They're kind of vanilla, and they could go with like a retro theme but do something more interesting something different at least because like as you've mentioned before like everybody who has this jersey or wants the retro theme jersey has the Reebok one 
there's not really any incentive to go out and get the Adidas one. And even now, I was at Jersey City. The Reebok ones, they look so similar, and they're like 100 bucks less. Yeah, and, you know, any sane person seeing that they're basically the same would go with the cheaper option. And I don't know. It just, to me, like, they should have went with something a little different, even if they're wanting, like, a retro theme do something a little different than what they did. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think if you look, I mean, we've seen it, and in 2009 when they re-released the retro jersey, it was fun, and it was cool, and it was new, and it was that throwback. Everyone loves the throwback. And then they took it out of circulation in 2013 for the what we'll call the script jersey and brought it back again in 2016. But to me, we've done it. It's It was fun. Yeah, it looks nice, but... I want something different, and I would be fine to create a new jersey that uses the retro color scheme, the non-black color scheme, the white C, but let's do a different striping pattern. Let's do something different. Maybe even do the current striping pattern in red, white, and yellow or something. But to me, I just, yeah, it looks nice, but I'm kind of over it. Yeah. And it's one of those things that, like, they they have other jerseys that they could have put out there. Like, they could have always brought back the pedestal jersey or something. Like, do a little something different, not just the same old, same old. Well, and I wouldn't even bring back the pedestal jersey. I mean, if you look back in 98, when the horse jersey came out, it was a completely different design. And fans loved it so much, it morphed into the design for all the jerseys. I'd be okay doing something completely different pattern-wise, instead of just, say, reviving the pedestal, but using the retro colors. One thing I was glad to see, though, was the Arizona Coyotes rocking their original jerseys. They should have never went away from those. I thought the same last yeah. year when the Ducks wore theirs. You know, even if the Flames took the, the script jersey, I never liked the pointy shoulders, but even if they took the striping pattern of the, of the script jersey, threw a white C on it, I mean, you could probably sell a bunch of those. Or even a black C. And, yeah. like, even out the shoulders so it goes all the way around. Uh, sort of yeah, like. Yeah, square them off on the front and the back. Yeah, and make it look nice. Uh, like, it, it wouldn't be a difficult tweak to what they had. And, and change the five. I've always said the five just looks like the two upside down on that font. Yeah, I know. But yeah, I just it seems like we're lacking creativity. It's like we need a third. Uh, let's just uh, bring back the retro. And I just feel like at this point it's been overdone. Yeah, it was fun. It was cool. But let's do something different. And I think especially when we had the outdoor game, there became an appetite for the retro again. But that's over. And I just, I don't know. I know every team's going to have a new third jersey next year. And I would not be surprised if the Flames were to go with something different. But at the very least, you have a black template for this striping pattern because Stockton uses it. Grab that one, throw a red C on it, and at least something different. We've seen the black on red. We've never seen red on black. And I think that would be something that some people might might buy. Yeah. Well, it, it's one of those things that... Right in, I'm just looking. I'm just looking here. Because the Black Sea came in in 2003. That was the first time we ever saw it. And it hasn't gone away since. Yeah, Sorry, It's one of those ahead. things that... There, with the team being the Flames, there are so many different ways that you can like creatively do something interesting with a team like that. Like Say like the Oilers, that's a little more narrow. And... With Calgary, though, you have... You remember the oil drop logo from the 90s? Oh, yeah. The Metal Gear thing with the oil... Yeah. the Yeah, the Todd McFarlane? Yeah. Like, you look at the Winnipeg Jets, their new third jersey. Like, that's a weird-looking jersey. And it's completely different from everything they've done before. And it's neat because of the fact that they're trying something different. It's not the best jersey, I'll admit, but at least they're going out and doing something unusual. And they're the Flames, like if they wanted to do a retro theme, they could do a whole host of different things, like even incorporating something along the lines of the retro jersey, or like even the color, or I mean the Heritage Classic jersey, 
where they went with like a darker red or like that wheat color for the white or you know like there's plenty of different i would never want that that made the seas look like they were dirty yeah well there's plenty of different ways that you could go about doing things differently and like i just feel like it's like oh people like this here you go and not really inspired at all I've never liked it when a team changes their logo on the third. I think the Flaming Sea, especially, is such an established logo. I don't want them to go do a horse or something like that again. Or there's been talk of taking the old, uh, the third jersey, the script jersey, shoulder pad logo, making it the, you know, main logo. I'd like to see a C there, but I'd say they go, like I said, white on red or red on black. But I think, yeah, there's different things you can do and still incorporate this C. And you are mentioning how there's so many things they can do be named the Flames. I think we should really give them credit considering how terrible some jerseys have been that we've never actually seen a jersey with flame on it. Yes, definitely. Like those uh, Tampa Bay Lightning jerseys with the thunderstorm on it, you know, and the lightning pants. Exactly. I mean, if this... If this was an ECHL team, they'd probably have, you know, flame going all the way up the jersey, all the way up the arms. Yeah, like, especially on the arms, like, having, like, flames on the arms, like, that would be just so bad. <laughs> I wonder if you could just do flames on the bottom and on the arms and not have the C on it and be like, yeah, you know who we are. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, the Vancouver Flying V jersey. Like, yes, V for Vancouver. Yay. That's right. We're creative. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, again, I mean, doing interesting things with the whole uniform. I always loved the original Tempa uniforms with the lightning bolt on the pants. I thought that was pretty cool. So could the Flames maybe, and even their pedestal jersey had some pretty cool pants. Um, if you look back at the striping there. But just doing something different, rethinking what they're doing and not just, oh, we need a third. Let's uh, roll out the retro again because it's easy. And we've already got the letters and numbers made. Like, I would like to see this team. Maybe we'll see it in a couple of years. Um, for the big anniversary, but I'd like to see this team do something a little bit different for that third. Yeah, I agree. Well, the last topic I think talking about what we're talking about aesthetics of this team is Smitty's uh, retro mask, since we're talking about the retro jerseys. And kind of a weird choice, Smitty got his, his mask painted to look like Mike Vernon's old, what was it, CCM helmet and cage combo. And it's even got an ear paint on the side. It's one of the weirdest paint jobs I've ever seen. Well, he did throw out a vintage Mike Vernon glove save in that game, so it seems fitting. By the power of Mike Vernon! Yeah, maybe he's becoming Vernon. I don't know. He should take uh, unretire Vernon's number for those... Can you imagine if he wore Vernon's number just in the retro jerseys? Yeah. <laughs> 30 for retro, yeah. 41 otherwise? Yeah. But if you haven't seen this, go take a look at it. Uh, we, I think we tweeted it earlier this week, but it's a really weird-looking mask. And I didn't think it would actually look good on the ice because, you know, it's got the, the molded chin and all that. But when I saw it on the ice, it actually looks pretty sweet. I'm glad he's not wearing it for every home game because they only wear the retros, what, 10 times a year? But it's pretty cool when you look at it for the retros, and it, it really fits the retro theme. I thought it was a really interesting way of going and, and a cool nod to Vernon. Yeah, I thought so too. It would have been so, so you, another thing that he could do is uh, pull Vernon's uh, first like regular goalie mask with like all the flames and on it. Well, if you, if you want to go with that, I'd say pull Kid, Kidder's pads, which I still, still think are the best Calgary Flames pads. Remember the red pads with the yellow flame coming up them? Yeah. I still think those are the best Flames goalie pads. Kid's mask and Kipper's mask were, I think, the two best Flames masks, period. I still remember uh, Kidder's mask. It was the two dragons, right? They were shooting the fire down his chin, and it made Kidder on the, on the chin? Yeah. And then he went to Carolina and he had, what, like a checkerboard mask. It was totally different. Yeah. I think that wraps up this week, Matt. Anything you, else you want to talk about before we look ahead? Oh, I'm just hoping that the Flames can tighten up defensively a bit. And like, they're playing better teams this upcoming week. And if they're giving up as many breakaway chances, then like I don't think this week will be a good one. No, this is, I think you were lucky to start against Vancouver because it gave you a bit of a chance to tune things up and not be in huge trouble. But if you look at the teams the Flames are playing, 
uh, this coming week and even really for the rest of the month, you're playing pretty good teams this month and you really need to tighten things up quickly or I can see some of these games getting away from the Calgary Flames very early on. Yeah, it'll basically be a prototypical Calgary Flames month if things don't change. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you and I talk about every every year, this team generally starts slow. It's often not till mid-November, early December that we see them going. I think one of the keys to success, and I didn't say this last week because I hadn't really thought it, thought about it, but they need to get a good start. I think they need to be 500 in October because we've seen them, you know, get behind the eight ball early, and so it's hard to recover from that. Yeah, uh, you can't bank on a seven game winning streak. No, you definitely can't. And like this team should be better than most of the uh, opposition, but you know them going out and doing it is another thing. Well, and for every seven game winning streak, and we've talked about this, for every seven game winning streak, you have a seven game losing streak. So you can't rely on that win streak because you're probably going to lose just as many at some point. So I think you've got to start early and get off to the right start, even if it's a bit with a couple line of tweaks every time. I think this month is really a good test of what can these Flames do against some top NHL teams. Yeah, and frankly, they need to be 500 at least in October to have a good start to the season any better than that obviously is awesome but uh, they can't like go five and eight or whatever how many of her games they play this 13 month. games so like, they need to win seven to be over 500 yeah like even if they're six six and one or something like that that'd be fine so they've got one down they got to find six more wins yep well, let's talk about this week, see if we can find at least maybe three of those this week. The Calgary Flames play three games. They all have different start times than we're used to. So they're all on the road this week. The Calgary Flames play in Nashville on Tuesday the 9th. That's a 6 p.m. start time, mountain time. Then they play Thursday in St. Louis, again, a 6 p.m. start time, and Saturday at Colorado, an 8 p.m. start time. So they play every other day this week. Then they have three days off before coming back home to play Boston on the 17th. So we've got a uh, game at Nashville, game at St. Louis, game at Colorado. Matt, how do you think they're going to do? Two and one. I think they'll beat uh, Nashville and Colorado and lose to St. Louis. Really? So you think they'll beat Nashville, beat Colorado? Nashville's a tough team. I know, but we seem to have their number, so... And all the games against Nashville tend to be really exciting ones where we prevail at the end. So always a good story when the, we play them, especially in their barn. Yeah, that's true. I'm going to go the same overall score, I think, 2-1, and one, but I'm going to go slightly different. I'm going to say the Flames beat Nashville and St. Louis. They tend to struggle against bad teams early, and I think that they're going to end up losing to Colorado. Um, which hopefully gives them some more drive against Boston. But I can, I don't know, I just, some this look at the Flames playing Edmonton a couple years ago where they beat them every game. The Flames tend to struggle early against bad teams. Yeah. See Vancouver so, game one. Exactly. So hopefully they'll be able to beat the two better teams. Um, I mean, Colorado's really the only one that might end up mattering there divisionally, but... Yeah, I think they'll beat Nashville, beat St. Louis. I think the Nashville game is going to be a fun one to watch. So that's uh, that'll be two and one if they can do that. Then they got three wins on the month so far, and then they only need to find three more for the rest of the month. That'll be that'll be easy for them to do. Hopefully, let's cross our fingers. Yeah, hopefully they can get get off to a, a better start to each game and just you know have an easier time of things instead of having to fight back like they did in the first two. Yeah, I think really the key to victory for all three of these is going to be special teams. If you can keep the puck out of your net when you're down a man and put the puck in the net when you're up a man, I think that's really going to be against, especially St. Louis and Nashville, I think special teams, whoever has the better special teams game is going to win. Matt, anything else you want to discuss this week before we uh, sign off? That's all, folks. Well, enjoy these three games, and we'll come back next week as we look ahead to the rematch from China. We'll be looking ahead to the game against Boston. So enjoy these three games on the road, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and happy Thanksgiving. 
Happy Thanksgiving. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.